What happens if I have this system here where blocks A and B have masses of A and B respectively, A is greater than B, pulley C, I'm going to label that here, that's C, is given upward, it's going to have the massless ropes and the pulley itself will be massless, and it is somehow accelerating upward at a acceleration of A naught. I'd like to know what uh, the acceleration of the blocks are. Now, you could be very um, keen and sort of say, well, I'm going to consider their accelerations relative to the pulley and apply F equals MA and sort of balance forces over top of the pulley and stuff like that. But the tricky thing about this is this pulley here is not part of an inertial reference frame. The inertial reference frame is watching this whole thing accelerating upward from an external perspective. So we have to apply Newton's laws in the inertial reference frame. So let's start out with the system. The system says, first, let's define a coordinate system. And shockingly, that coordinate system will be that y is increasing in the vertical direction. So uh, we are going to then talk about the height of, the, of one rope. Let's say that that rope is going to be the distance from that B is from the center of the pulley. I'm going to give that a sort of separate variable that I am going to call Y. And I'm going to say that that variable, I don't know what that height is, but I do, do know that I'm going to define D squared Y DT squared to be acceleration of B in the Y direction or in yeah in the y direction and so that's just this additional component uh there and so let's let me call it a sub y b that's better okay then i'm going to write down my f equals ma so for the a object the force upward is going to be given by a tension force and then there's going to be mass of a times g downward and that's the only forces that are on it for b we have a very similar free body diagram there's a tension force pulling up and then there's a uh, weight pulling down the tricky part about this is writing down f equals ma the sum of the forces are going to be in the y direction for, uh, let's do B first. Uh, the sum of the forces in the Y direction for this is going to be T minus MBG is equal to mass of B times the acceleration. And the acceleration is going to be whatever the acceleration of this is with respect to the pulley plus an additional acceleration of the pulley with respect to the Earth. And so that's going to end up being a naught plus a y b. So that gives us that acceleration. Now these accelerations are linked. So if b is moving upward at acceleration in the y direction, a y b, then the uh, acceleration of a is, I'm going to say that it has an acceleration uh, that's up, uh, that is going to be uh, T minus M A times G, and then that's the mass of object A times A naught. And then the trick here is that if the uh, acceleration A Y is positive, A Y B is positive, A uh, mass of A is going to be moving down at the same acceleration. And so I can say that in the coordinate system that this is minus A Y B. And so that's going to give me my uh, two sets of equations, and now it's all over but the algebra. So uh, at this point, I can go ahead and I say, I'm going to solve this equation by um, solving both equations for t and then equating those. I'm going to solve, essentially, yeah, I'm going to say that here, the tension, oops, the tension is equal to mass of A times G is equal to the mass of A times A naught minus A Y B. And then, uh, sorry, uh, 
that's not a eh, let's um, erase a little bit make that a little cleaner so that's going to be plus that's not an equal sign uh, the next one is going to be that the tension force here is equal to mbg plus mb times a naught plus a y b I'll equate these two and I'd like to uh, isolate for the acceleration a y b so I'm going to get that this is m a g plus m a times a naught minus a y b is equal to m b g plus m b times a naught plus a y b okay uh, I can solve, I'm trying to solve for these variables. I want them on one side of the equation by itself. So I'm going to push them over to the right side and gather everything else to the left side. So that's equal to MAG minus MBG uh, plus MA, uh, sort of distributing here, MA acceleration zero, A, A naught, um, and minus m b times acceleration naught is equal to m a times a y b plus m b times a y b and then um, i'll go ahead and grab all this math Boop. copy it go to our next page Uh, paste it. There's our math. Okay, a little extra to boot. There we are. There's our math. Uh, let's delete all the crap we got with it and keep solving. Whew, we made it. All right. So uh, I'm going to factor out uh, this. I'm going to pull out an MA minus MB from both terms. B is e times G uh, plus MA minus MB times A naught. And then uh, that's going to come over here. I'm going to factor out an MA plus MB from both terms here. Uh, times a y b and then I'm going to um, uh, keep factoring over here this is m a minus m b times g plus a naught uh, is equal to m a plus m b uh, times a y b solve for a y b at long last that is equal to uh, m a minus mb times g plus a naught all over uh, ma plus mb. And then the total acceleration of an object is going to be the a naught. Uh, so we found that the acceleration for object a was going to be a naught minus a y b. And so for example, that's a naught minus ma minus mb times g plus a naught over m a plus m b okay and then a sub b is going to be equal to a naught plus a y b and that is equal to a naught plus m a minus m b times g plus a naught all over M A plus M B. Okay, Whew. lots of algebra, but uh, we do uh, have the capacity to say a little bit more uh, about this. I want to consider a case, and this is a good way to check your math at the end, which is: Does this make sense in a limit? And the limit that I want to consider here is: What happens if? Question mark. What if? What? if m a equaled m b and if we return to kind of what that looks like uh not the cows and peas but here 
if we return to this uh, case, we would see that these two masses would be equal. And so they would sort of just say fixed there and the whole thing would accelerate upward together at a naught because there's some force that's pulling it upward. Well, does that make sense with the math that we've derived? Well, if MA equals MB, then this difference here is going to be zero. And so then this whole second term will drop off and I'm just left with the accelerations of both objects being a not so that that makes a lot of sense i think we're kind of happy with that uh another limit we could consider uh is what happens if m a is much much greater than m b so that then uh in that case what would happen is m a here would dominate this m b term so this would go to m a and this MA plus MB, when I add those together, it's about MA. So then these would cancel out and we would end up with our answer being that the um, B would go upward at uh, two uh, at um, MAG plus twice the acceleration. And then A would go downward. Um, this would just go uh, downward at basically minus mg. So essentially A would free fall down, B would rocket upward, um, and we'd end up with a uh, rapidly accelerating uh, system moving upward. So that seems like it would kind of make sense as well. Okay. Uh, so that kind of gives us our uh, two uh, pieces that we could consider here in limiting case. And it also illustrates the care that we need by analyzing this in the, non in the inertial reference frame. All right. I want to do a kind of quick example. Well, it's not a quick example. It's an illustrative example because this is kind of an important case of what happens to an object in the case of a fluid resistance. We're going to work with the Stokes drag model and we're going to imagine dropping a metal ball into a tall container of oil and ask what is the position of the ball as a function of time if we assume that we have this uh, drag force, uh, F drag is minus K, and this should be a V vector, uh, not a V unit vector. Assume it starts with Nagel's rule and initial velocity at the top of the oil. So if we start out with this setup and we uh, correct this to be a proper velocity vector, I want to set up uh, the problem uh, as follows, which is I have an object that is um, moving and I'm going to choose it, a weird coordinate system. I'm going to assume that the y direction is moving downward. Uh, I have that choice. It's just a little bit easier because then we can sort of figure out things moving to larger velocities correspond to uh, positive numbers uh, in this case. So if we think about mg is the weight pulling down, and then we have an unbalanced drag force, which is pointing up. And this means that we have an equation, k, uh, sorry, we have in this coordinate system, mg pulls it downward and minus k times v uh, pulls it upward. So it's negative because it's pointing upward, but the uh, positive direction is downward, therefore it gets a negative sign. And that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. Well, that's exciting. And this is our first case that we run into where the accelerations are not constant. And that means we have to be careful. Uh, and by careful, I mean calculus. So I'm gonna do a couple things. The first thing I want to do is I want to divide the whole problem through by the constant k. I'm gonna divide that by k, that by k, and that by k. And the reason is, is that this mg over k is something I have seen before. I call that the terminal velocity. Then I cancel out these k's, and then I have an mk over there. So I get an equation that looks like this. I get that this whole thing becomes vt minus v, terminal velocity minus v, is equal to m over k times the acceleration. But an acceleration is a time derivative of the velocity. So now we have an expression that looks a lot like uh, some calculus. And now I'm going to engage in what the mathematicians like to call 
a gross abuse of differential forms, which is I'm going to multiply both sides by a tiny time interval and divide both sides by v over vt. So I'm essentially solving for v, uh, I'm putting all of the v's on one side by itself and all of the t's on the other side by themselves. And so if I do that multiplication, I'm going to get that this is k over m times dt, and there's a reason why I'm gonna kind of bookkeep the constant there, equals dv over vt minus v. So if you look at this, you're like, oh, okay, this uh, looks uh, pecu you know, peculiar. I can sort of understand what's happening here uh, is that this term went, oops, this term went into the denominator down here under this dv, and this k over m, uh, m over k became a k over m over there, and then this dt went up. And we can do this. It's not technically correct, but it is correct enough for physics, if not for math. So, sorry math folks, uh, I did a bad thing. All right, uh, the next thing that I want to do is to solve this equation, and I'm going to solve this by integrating. Uh, and this is a neat thing where I can say, well, in a tiny, like physically what this means is that in a tiny interval of time, times some number, the velocity changes by an amount that's one over vt minus v. It's basically the velocity increases by an amount, and but that amount depends on how close it is to the terminal velocity. If v is small, it increases by, uh, uh, it's going to increase uh, by one over vt, and that number is going to get uh, smaller uh, as v is going to get closer to uh, the v, so it's going to become one over a small number, which would get larger and uh, larger. Okay, so at this point, we can do a little bit of uh, calculus. And that calculus is, we're just going to integrate both sides of the equation uh, from the start of the problem to the end of the problem. So what that means is I can integrate the uh, left-hand side from 0 to t, there's some constant in front, k over m uh, dt, and that's an easy integral, so we're happy with that. And then for the final one, uh, at from 0 to t, we're going to say that the velocity goes from 0 to some unknown speed v, and then we're going to integrate dv over vt minus v. Uh, so the left-hand integral, it's a straightforward one uh, because the k of ram are, non -con are, are constant. So it's the integral of dt uh, from t to t0. So this is k or uh, m, so from 0 to t, uh, times t minus 0. That's the final minus the initial uh, here. And that just goes to km over t. The right-hand side's a little trickier. Um, and earlier, uh, I asserted that the integral of 1 over x was the natural log of x. And so that's a similar case that we have here, is we have a natural log, but then we have this constant that's added onto it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, consider, I'm going to first off, I'm going to change the order of the denominator by introducing a negative sign. So I'm going to say this is negative, negative integral 0 to v of dv over v minus vt. So that's just algebra. I can always multiply through by a negative 1, uh, or pull out a negative 1. And then this second term I'm going to assert is the in, is uh, that little coefficient doesn't uh, matter for the integration. And I'm going to say that this is equal to, uh, this whole thing will go to an integral that is the natural log of v minus vt. And I'm just kind of writing it there in red uh, as an indicator because I have to remember my bounds of integration as well. Uh, so the po important point is that I'm going to take the derivative of that and I get whatever's inside, one over whatever's inside, so that's one over v minus vt times the derivative of that, and then that uh, is uh, with the vt is just constant drops out, so it just leaves me with uh, one. And so therefore, the derivative of this expression will get me back to here, 
as hoped for. Okay, so that means that I can take uh, the negative sign and then uh, this is equal to the natural log of v minus vt evaluated at zero to whatever the final velocity is. And so from there, I'm going to come back and I'll write the left-hand side again, again. So that's kt over m. And then the right-hand side, I'm going to have to integrate, uh, evaluate at the start, which is negative natural log of v minus vt. Uh, minus uh, the integral or minus the answer evaluated at zero. And if I plug zero in here, I just get that this is minus the natural log of negative VT. Uh, okay. And I'm going to pull that minus sign over to the other side. I really want to get it away from my natural log. So this is negative KT over M. And then I'm going to use my rules of logarithms. And I know that the difference of logs is equal to the log of the quotient of those. So this is the natural log of V minus VT over negative VT. And so then I'm going to uh, divide these both these parts by uh, VT. And then I'm going to end up with the natural log of 1 minus v over vt. And then I can exponentiate both sides. So I get that 1 minus v over vt is equal to e to the negative kt over m. And I'll go ahead and I will solve uh, this expression that I will get 1 minus e to the negative kt over m is equal to v over vt. And then that's just going to go that v as a function of time, so I'm introducing now function notation, is v of t times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. And if I look at that function, it has a graph that looks a little something like this. It starts out, so it's time versus velocity. If I have up here at the top, I have my terminal velocity. This is a graph that starts out at zero and rises up, but asymptotes to the terminal velocity. So it gets closer and closer to the terminal velocity, but this exponential means that we never arrive there. It actually just reaches a limit where it can no longer, uh, you know, or it, it just limits to that in infinite time. So it gets closer and closer, but never actually arrives at the terminal velocity. It's really cool. Oh, uh, darn it, we want the position. Well, uh, this is, uh, as we say in the business, calculus. So I'm going to grab my formula for the velocity. I'm going to copy it. We're going to head to page two. Welcome to our own exciting world of Page two. Okay, so I've got this wonderful little expression here and a little bit more besides, it looks like. Yeah, goodbye for that piece. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to understand how to turn this into a position. Well, I'm going to use the same approach, which is oops, in a different color, uh, that the velocity here is just the position derivative as a function of time, and that is a co constant, vt, uh, times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. And then I can uh, isolate for my variables. So dx is equal to vt times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m all times dt, and I have everything with a position variable over here, and I have everything with a, um, a uh, everything with a time variable over here, and ooh, I'm actually, let me back up here before this gets too awful. I'm going to call this the y direction, not the x direction. I apologize for getting very enthusiastic about x's. I, I have plenty of x's, uh, so but we're going to do y's here because y. Uh, and then we're going to integrate uh, this expression from the start to the finish. And so we go from 0 to wherever we are actually considering the position 
uh, is from zero to whatever the time is. So the left-hand side of this equation is pretty straightforward. That is just y minus zero, also known as y. Uh, and then the x component is just the integral of this expression. Uh, and I can pull out my vt, and then I'll integrate 1 minus e to the minus kt over m all times dt. And uh, the way integrals work is that you can integrate the sum of the integrals is the integral of the sums. And so I get vt, and then I get two integrals. Integral of 1 dt, also known as dt from 0 to t, minus the integral from 0 to t of e to the negative kt over m dt. And so then that's vt times, uh, this first term is just the time, and then the second term, uh, well, it's the integral of an exponent. Now, important rule in calculus that integral e to the x dx is just equal to e to the x. The integral of e to the x is itself. This isn't e to the x, though. It's e to the negative kt over m with a dt. So what I'm going to do is what's called a variable substitution, which I'm going to say that u is a new variable, is negative kt over m. Well, that's exciting. Uh, and so then I can rewrite this integral as integral 0 to, well, t, whatever that is, uh, of e to the u. That's great. But then I actually have to worry about the dt's. So I have to calculate what du by dt is, and that's minus k over m, and then I'll say that du is equal to negative k over m dt, engaging in my gross abuse of differential forms. And when I do that, I need to make sure that I have a du uh, over here, and so that's just needs, that says I can get my dt, that's the hard part, and then I need to multiply that by negative uh, k over m. But what we're going to do is we're going to say that this is, uh, I'm going to multiply by negative m over k times negative k over m times dt. And then this expression, the this part here, becomes the du, leaving a coefficient to come out front. Let me close my square bracket because otherwise we're being uncivilized. And then uh, we pop on down here and we do a little more calculus. So this is vt times t minus, and then this uh, m over k term comes out front, so negative m over k. And then we do the integral from 0 to t of e to the u du, which I asserted previously was v of t times t minus minus, ooh, that's exciting, plus m of k times e to the u du uh, is just e to the u du. So this is e to the u evaluated from 0 to t. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, it means I have to return to my variable substitution and stick things back in here. So this is t plus m over k times the uh, e to the u is e to the negative kt over m evaluated at t, so that's e to the minus kt over m, okay, that's cool, minus this thing at 0, and e to the 0 is 1, so it's that over 1. Uh, and so this gives me an expression for what's actually happening, and sort of says that this object is going to start out falling very slowly but then it's going to eventually come up and hit a sort of straight line where the slope of this straight line, sorry, this is t and y, uh, and then the slope of this line, so dy by dt, is going to be approximately equal to the terminal velocity. So it accelerates up and then hits the constant speed and then just keeps moving. Okay, as promised, wasn't easy but it's illustrative of many of the techniques we need. And so we're starting out with this, and as you become more and more comfortable with integrals through your math class, we're going to find that we can do more and more physics problems because they all fall around this basic idea that we're going to write down f equals ma, and then right here is all the physics.
we can then say that a is the time derivative of velocity, and we can actually figure out where the object will be, not just how fast it's accelerating. So it's really actually kind of an exciting set of mechanics that we have in front of us. OK. For my final act, I want to solve this problem, which shows a bead having a mass of 0.75 kilograms and negligible size slides over the surface of a circular rod for which the coefficient of kinetic friction is mu k is 0.3. The radius of the collar is 0.1 meters. And basically, so this is a little ring with a bead on it, and that bead is sliding around like this, but there's friction, so it slowly comes to a stop. And the answer is, if I give it a flick, how far around the rod does it go as it travels? So this is going to require just some techniques. And I want to set up the physics, and then I'll just sort of say, okay, the physics is done. And then it's all math all the time, uh, which, I mean, is a thrill for a lot of people. Uh, so uh, let's uh, get going on this. So I kind of have to consider this in three dimensions. And so I kind of have two free body diagrams. I'm going to kind of consider them uh, from here. So if I look down on the top of the bead, I have the bead, and it's going around a circle like this. I'm going to sort of consider it here in uh, this kind of xy plane. So if I consider x and y like this, then it has a force towards the center of the circle that's provided by the normal force, and I'm going to call this the horizontal component of that. And then if it's traveling, it has a kinetic friction force that's pulling backwards, so that's going to have uh, a variable fk. And those are the only forces on it. Um, the, from the side view, This is kind of looking at this in the y, z direction. There's this bead. It has a friction force. This is the same force as is over here. Same forces, same forces. But in this direction, in the z direction, there is a normal force that I'm called the vertical component of the force that opposes the weight, mg. And that keeps it on the rod. So this means that there is a normal force uh, from the vertical and the horizontal component, and that the total component of the vector force, n, is equal to n horiz plus n vert squared. So that's from the Pythagorean theorem. And this is the important thing. That is the normal force that goes into the kinetic friction model not the horizontal force only, and not the vertical force only, but the total normal force is what's determining the coefficient. So it's sliding around and the normal force keeps it on this track and also it supports it from falling off of the bead. So it's those two components that gives me my total normal force uh, here. And so then my uh, kinetic friction uh, force is just gonna be mu k times n. Now we know a little bit more about the forces. We know that the horizontal component of the normal force, this one up here, is the only one oriented towards the center of the circle. It's operating in the direction of that sort of black line shown there. And so therefore, the normal component of the horizontal force must provide the centripetal acceleration at any given time. Here's the weird thing. That friction, that coefficient depends on the speed. The speed contributes to the normal horizontal force. Oops, up here. That creates a friction force which reduces the speed. So we are not going to be in a constant acceleration system, and so we've got to be extra careful. Uh, so uh, we know that the normal component is doing that. We also know a bit about the vertical component. We know that the vertical component of the force, n vert, minus mg is just going to be equal to zero. So the vertical component 
is equal to mg. So that's really pretty cool because we have an expression for the horizontal and the vertical components of the forces, and then we can relate that to the kinetic friction force. And what we want to do is calculate the uh, uh, force here in the tangential direction. So the normal force is uh, this component, and then the tangential component, the sum of the forces in the tangential direction, F sub t, which is the negative, uh, the y direction, as kind of illustrated here, is just going to be negative F sub k, which is negative mu sub k times n, because it's slowing down. That is equal to the mass times the tangential acceleration, and that is m times dv by dt. So a little bit of a hint, there's some calculus coming. Okay, so now we've done all the physics. It's finished. We've written down our equations. We can solve uh, some, uh, we can solve them. So let's actually do that. So I just said, that the dv by dt times mass was equal to negative mu k times the normal force, which is negative mu k times the square root of the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared. And then that is equal to negative mu k times mv squared over it's too messy even for me. mv squared over r, that's the horizontal component squared, plus the vertical component squared, which is mg quantity squared. That is equal to m times dv by dt. So the first thing I want to do is I want to factor out an m squared from the radical, because then that gives me uh, minus mu k times square root of v to the fourth over r squared plus g squared, and then a mass comes out times m is m times dv by tt, and I can get rid of that pesky mass. It's done. Ooh, I typically like to do that in red to show that that's not actually part of my writing. <gasps> Fantastic. So then I end up with an expression uh, that says dv by dt is equal to negative mu k times the square root of v to the fourth. I'm actually going to pull out a r squared from this. I'll square root of r squared it gives me an r underneath. And so I get a v to the fourth plus g squared r squared inside my radical. Okay. So at this point, I could go ahead and solve this to figure out what dv by dt is, integrate both sides with respect to time, all that, just what I did uh, with the fluid drag. But I'm going to use a slightly different technique, because once upon a time, back in lecture, part one, I made the assertion that v dot dv is equal to a dot ds. So what I will do is I'll use this expression as a start, and I will actually use this expression as the acceleration. Uh, and so that has an expression there for just uh, v's and co constants in the problem. So I will substitute that in, and I will solve for ds. So I will get uh, divide both sides by a, a, so I get ds is equal to v dv dv all over a, and so then that's going to give me the expression that uh, v dv, so that's uh, equal to v dot dv is equal over the square root of negative mu k over r times the square root of v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. Okay, and then that's ds, so I can integrate both sides, so I can integrate from zero to my final s ds is equal to the integral from where I start in speed, that's v naught, and where I finish, which is zero, and that's uh, negative r over mu k, using the rules of compound fractions, times the integral uh, times v dot dv over the square root of v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. 
And then I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation. So I'll pull out this part here. That's a constant. So I will pull it out in front of my integral. So that's negative r over mu k integral from v0 to 0 of v dot dv over v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. Now g squared r squared has units of velocity to the fourth as well. Uh, so what I can do is uh, sort of recognize that this integral is all kind of dimensionally uh, looking, oh, there's a square root. Now it's looking dimensionally great because it's the square root of v to the fourth. And then on top, v has units of uh, velocity and dv has units of velocity. So this means that I'm going to be fine if I consider the velocities of the two um, Oh, or it's, uh, it's I'm going to be fine because this whole expression in here is going to be dimensionless. Sorry, this whole expression in here will be dimensionless. And then I have an answer that is just the length r over uh, mu k. OK, so now I can sort of start uh, ca uh, calculating things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize, and uh, that's the key part of math. I'm going to start out by doing s uh, the integral on the right side, which just is sf minus 0. or So the final distance uh, that it travels is negative mu over uh, r, sorry, r over mu k. And then this integration here, I mean, I could just plug this into Wolfram alpha or something. Uh, but, you know, a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to do at this point is to try uh, to find another variable that I am going to try to, you know, do my calculations with respect to. And so uh, basically a u substitution. So I'm going to look for a variable u, and I'm going to set that to be equal to b squared over g times r. And then if I do that, then du is going to be equal to... 2 uh, du is going to be 2v, sorry, du by dv is du is going to be 2v over g times r, because that's just the constant, or du is just going to be 2g over r times uh, v dot dv. And so if I make that substitution, I'm going to factor out that root g over uh, the g squared r squared. I'm going to factor that out. And I'm going to get that this whole thing is just the integral from v naught to 0. And then I'm going to pull out that g squared r squared. So uh, I'm going to get uh, v dot dv over gr, because I take the square root of it, times 1 over the square root of v to the fourth over g squared r squared plus 1. Uh, and then I'm going to look at this up here, my v squared over gr, and recognize that that is just my u squared. Uh, and so we get minus r over mu k times v naught over 0 uh, times uh, v dot dv over g times r times the square root of u squared plus 1. And so then this expression uh, just keeps simplifying, mu over rk. I recognize now that this vdv over gr, it looks a lot like my du. I just need an extra factor of 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide by 2. So this is 0 uh, to v naught of 2v dot dv over gr times 1 over the square root of u squared plus 1. OK, uh, we have done a little bit of running out of room, so I will grab the current mathematics here. I will copy. I will bring in another page, and then we will put that math in here. OK, uh, so then, uh, as I said, and as I said, this is negative r over 2 mu k times uh, du over the square root of u squared plus 1 from v naught down to 0. And if I do that integral, uh, 
this is something where I do have to go and look up an expression or be very good at calculus, uh, I will know that this answer is r over 2 times mu k times altogether the natural log of u uh, squared plus 1 plus u. And so that expression, when I take the derivative of it, will get back to my 1 over u squared plus 1. Let me neaten this up just a smidge. Natural log. There we are. Now I can do my substitutions, uh, recalling that I have done a u substitution here where u is equal to v squared over rg. And I can calculate my uh, values by uh, uh, carry out this integral. I should actually be precise and say I'm going from v naught to zero. So this is going to give me an answer here uh, that says this is r over two mu k. And then when I stick in at zero, uh, this goes to the natural log of zero squared plus one. The natural log of one is zero. And then the uh, u in that case is also zero so i get an answer that's zero for sub a zero minus the natural log of v to the fourth v naught to the fourth over rg uh r squared g squared plus one minus because i have to distribute the negative sign in there v naught squared over rg uh as my values, and then I have the r over 2k and the negative sign up front. So my final speed is equal to r over, or the final distance I travel is r over 2 mu k uh, times the natural log of v naught to the fourth over rg plus 1 minus v naught squared over rg. And then I can plug in all my values and I get that this is 0 0.1 meters. This is 2 times 0.3, the coefficient of friction, times the natural log of the initial speed, which was 4 meters per second to the fourth over 0 0.1 uh, meters times 10 meters per second squared, secretly chosen to always cancel out. Uh, plus 1 minus same answer 4 meters per second squared over 0 0.1 meters times 10 meters per second uh, quantity or seconds squared uh, subtract off so this is 4 to the fourth uh, plus 1 natural log this is uh, this whole mess goes to 16 this mess goes to the natural log of 4 to the 4th plus 1, and then we get that uh, uh, these values over here. And when we work out and substitute in on our calculator, we get an answer of about 0 0.6 meters. So this all covers basically a bunch of mathematics. Uh, and it sort of illustrates some techniques that once you get better with integrals, uh, you're kind of able to solve them. But the key part, and I'll just sort of come back to this again, is the physics. And I just want to highlight that the friction force here depends on the three-dimensional realization of the problem and the two components of the normal force. How do I know? I tried to solve it without the second component of the normal force and kept having my bead move forever. So don't do that. Uh, you need both components of the normal force to get this solved in place and they are not slipping against the ramp. Actually, we're going to continue the, uh, consider the case where they are getting close uh, to slip because we want to solve for the case where the minimum speed that the car can travel around the circle without slipping. Okay, I'm actually gonna take this over to regular uh, grid paper because we're gonna need some space. So we have our uh, ramp. And we have a car on it, which, uh, as with all physics, is just a point mass. Now, when consider the forces on that object, and I should note that this angle here is theta, and there are some forces on it. 
there is a static friction. There is a normal force, which is normal to the ramp. There's an mg, which is pointing down. And finally, there is a static friction force. And I don't know whether it points up the ramp or down the ramp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it pointing up the ramp for now. And if we get to an answer that's negative, it tells us that our answer was wrong, uh, or direction was wrong, and it must be pointing the other direction, much like we saw with the normal force in the roller coaster, where the negative force means that we just picked the wrong direction in our free body diagram. And so it's pointed in the opposite direction compared to what we took. So normally, under most circumstances, I would come up with a normal tangential coordinate system uh, that's oriented in the ramp. And I would solve the problem there. We're not going to do that in this case. And there's an important reason why. Is that normally you pick the thing that has the coordinate system where the forces kind of do the least projections uh, and you do the least amount of trig. But there's an overarching principle, which is if you're going to pick a coordinate system, it's generally best that your accelerations are oriented with the coordinate system because you can decompose forces plenty. And so that's what I need to do. I need to pick a coordinate system where the accelerations are uh, in the, um, uh, or are oriented in that direction. And you might think, well, it's going around a ramp in a circle. So it's sort of coming out of the page, uh, hurtling towards us. And it's on this kind of circular ramp that's kind of banked uh, to the side. In that case, isn't the acceleration just down the ramp uh, because it's pointing towards the center of the circle? The answer is no. The acceleration always points to the center of the circle that the object is traversing. And so if we think about it sort of going around a circle, it's at a horizontal plane uh, in this kind of three-dimensional object. And so the centripetal acceleration is pointing horizontally. So it's centripetal acceleration is pointing uh, straight to the center in the sort of x, y direction, not in the nt direction. So I'm going to do all my physics in the x, y coordinate system because the centripetal acceleration is only in the x direction. And if I do that, then I can start doing some decompositions. All right. So first off, it's not moving vertically. It's not moving up or down vertically. So I know that the sum of the forces in the y direction are going to have an acceleration of zero, and that the sum of the forces in the x direction, I'm going to pick x sort of pointing horizontally here, is going to be the mass of the car times how fast it's going over the radius of the circle, uh, where r is how far I am from the center of the circle. Okay, uh, given that, um, call that v squared over big R, then I do just some force decomposition. Well, um, if I look at my uh, problem here, I can see that this angle, well, we're not doing that decomposition. We almost always do that decomposition, but we're going to do this decomposition instead and get these forces into the xy uh, plane. And so if I do that, this angle is theta, and this angle is theta. Therefore, for the forces in the y direction, I have two for components pointing up. I have that that's n times the cosine of theta points up, uh, plus the static friction force sine theta also points up, minus mg points down. And then I can actually, I want to consider the limiting case and so I'm going to set my static friction force to be mu s n, which is the max friction case. Normally I don't get to do this, but I want the minimum speed. And so this requires the most amount of friction. And so that's what's going to allow me to get away from that. So I'll be able to substitute that in here in a moment. Now, the next thing I want to do is consider the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction. The normal force has a x component pointing in that direction. The friction force is pointed in the opposite direction, as we've set. So we know that those two forces will carry the opposite sign. So we have the normal force sine theta minus 
the friction force cos theta is going to have an acceleration mv squared over r towards the center of the circle. And now we're basically done. We don't know what the normal force is, and we want to solve for v, but we have two equations uh, with which we can do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of algebra, which I'm sure is a thrill to everybody. So uh, I'm going to first solve this equation on top up here for uh, the normal force uh, by recognizing that the normal force cos theta plus fs, oh, sorry, uh, I'm trying to actually do the substitution, mu s times normal force times sine theta. I'm going to push the mg over to the other side where the zero is, so it just becomes mg. I'm going to factor out an n and divide through by the rest of the mass. So that's equal to mg over cos theta plus mu s sine theta. And then I have a normal force that I can stick into the x direction equation, recognizing that there's also a normal force there. So I'm going to say that the normal force times sine theta minus mu s n cos theta is equal to mv squared over r. And then I will uh, pull out a normal force, the normal force times sine theta minus mu s cos theta is equal to mv squared over r. And now my substitution comes in, that normal force goes in there. And so then I get that this is mg uh, sine theta minus mu s cos theta. That's the remnants at the top. Then I'll put the denominator that I solve for from the normal force underneath. So that's cos theta plus mu s sine theta. And that whole mass is equal to mv squared over r. Ooh, life's good. My masses cancel out. And then I can solve, put my r up there and take the square root. So I end up with I'm going to just exchange sides here because I'm getting close to a solution. Uh, that's Rg times sine theta minus mu s cos theta. I really should use my copy paste function more. Uh, cos theta plus mu s sine theta. And take the square root and we're done. So square root of Rg times sine theta minus mu s cos theta over cos theta plus mu s sine theta. Finished. We got ourselves an answer. And the friction force didn't turn out negative uh, because uh, as long as that sort of angle is set up here. So uh, we looked like we picked the right direction uh, when we got going. So everything is grand.